You are listening to Seniors Junction Podcast. We are preventing seniors' isolation one conversation at a time. Your hosts today are Dr. Namrada Magaria and myself, Dr. Paul Merkley. We are the co-founders of Seniors Junction. Our very special guest today is Dr. Jaya Sankar. She is a Texas-based rheumatologist and geriatrician and the founder and president of JSR Health. Welcome, Jaya. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. So as you already mentioned, I am a rheumatologist and a geriatrician um, and have a background in internal medicine. I have also worked in public health arena and uh, Namrata and I actually went to the college together for public health. and uh, most of my work is uh, involving elderly population and uh, helping them out with their health challenges, helping them out with their um, emotional and behavioral challenges. So I'm actually uh, very honored to be a part of Seniors Junction and be here to discuss these issues with you. Uh, it's Thank amazing. You. It's amazing to have uh, firstly three Harvard alumni on the call. So that's firstly awesome. And the second part is someone you studied with, like we've grown up together, Paul, like, you know, we know each other since 2009 and uh, like, and we are really close friends. So we've personally and professionally witnessed each other. And we never thought because she had taken up uh, quality healthcare quality and I took up mother and child health in Harvard. And both of us are now in, uh, you know, this, uh, I'm in Geron technology and she's in uh, geriatrics. So it's, 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 it was never planned, but it's, it's, it's one of the, this is, I think one of those sweet moments recording a podcast when I personally know somebody since like a long time. (laughs) And I think this will be the most serious I've ever been with her on a call and not, I'm trying, I'll try not to be funny and crack jokes. Okay. So, (laughs) so Jaya, I know that you've worked extensively with elder population in, uh, in the U S and now you, you practice in, uh, in Texas now. So can you tell me if you encountered social isolation in your population and if yes, uh, what were the pain points? Yes, Namrata, that's a very, very important question and a very important problem these days, especially with the COVID time, social isolation became a really big problem, not just in geriatric age group, but in a lot of other population as well, especially if they had more chronic diseases, uh, more so in geriatric population. And there were multiple barriers that were identified that sometimes like they had mobility issues, they had like a lot of joint pains, they have a history of falls, they're they're not comfortable walking anymore, they're not able to drive, so they are not able to make it to uh, social meetings or social gatherings or not even able to drive to their family members. Uh, That kind of led to a lot of depression and uh, a lot of um, feelings of isolation in my geriatric population. Transport and commutation also became a huge problem. Even coming to the doctor's office um, became a huge problem that they had to call in, arrange transport, they have to set a day. So it just doesn't stay like, okay, today you want to go somewhere and you can go. And you have to depend on quite a lot of things. In addition to that, I've noticed that hearing deficit causes a huge amount of problem. A lot of my geriatric population, they have hearing deficit, which is unrecognized. So now if they're in a social meeting and they're trying to talk to people and when people are talking, but they don't hear certain pitches and they don't hear certain voices very well. So they're not able to respond that meaningfully. They're not able to interact with them and participate in the communication and most of them don't even um, are uh, like they don't even realize that they have some hearing deficit which is even more surprising so I think uh, spreading awareness among these things can help and access to hearing aids could be very expensive so there's a very very uh, small cheap method that there is a stethoscope that is available uh, the start of a uh, stethoscope sometimes we have used that in our clinics and we give them that so and that we can discard basically so they can put them in their ear and we use the mouthpiece, they, we use the bell and we speak in that. So it kind of helps them hear better. So those are the things that the, the, the little things that can be done to help them out. Another thing is vision. Sometimes they're not able to see things as well. So for example, they go to some, some art gallery or something, they're not able to see things, they're not able to appreciate things, they're not able to give the responses that the other people are kind of expecting. So these things should be recognized and these things should be um, like other people should be aware of it as as much as the geriatric population so they can accommodate for these um, these, uh, issues. 
Um, a lot of times I've also noticed that memory changes are there. So they know the, they remember the names of the remote, like the very close family members, but sometimes they meet new people and they might not remember that they've met them. They might not remember their faces. They might not remember their names. So those bring another challenges. Some of my patients who have like Parkinson's disease or some other tremors, they have some little facial expressions which would be like very mass faces or which can have, they can have like uh, some twitches and all, which uh, can again hinder the social uh, uh, interaction. And then all of this can lead to depression. So the patient now already have been going all of, through all these things and now that led to depression. So all the more reason that they don't want to interact with anyone. So they kind of um, shut themselves down. And then they start staying in their own, and that's when the real depression sinks in, and then it just goes downhill from there. So it's a it's a very very big problem, especially in the geriatric population. And I also want to recognize some of the younger population who are dealing with a lot of chronic problems, who are who have these issues as well. And uh, I think seniors are doing a great job in bringing this together. And uh, very yeah. happy about I think. That. I think, uh, Paul, we had identified all these causes, right, sensory losses. So I think uh, the way we had discussed is uh, as we age, uh, it's a time of losses. So sensory loss, mobility loss, uh, cognitive loss, friends and family who pass away, income loss, purpose loss. So there's lots of losses, constant losses that that happen and that will continue to happen. And... Uh, and I think all I can say is for me, it's almost like reading a textbook talking to you because, you know, it's 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 number one cause of someone getting isolated as per the report, or report by the National Academy of Medicine is hearing loss, number one, you know. And uh, Paul, do you think that uh, it's pretty much what we also observe? Yes, and I, just as you were speaking, mm -hmm. I thought about Beethoven. Mm -hmm. Because really, I, my idea of Beethoven is that his hearing loss, while it did not affect his ability to compose, I'm pretty sure he didn't want his potential patrons to know that he was deaf. Would you want to be the wealthy patron who said, oh, I've commissioned a symphony from the deaf composer? I don't think so. So I think he stayed away from people in every way he could with his very... Uh, brittle personality and demeanor in order not to be discovered as being deaf and when you talked about the stethoscope and speaking through the stethoscope uh he had to use an ear trumpet right for many many years so it was very interesting to think yes these are things we've talked about and the hearing loss does seem to be the first yeah. one doesn't it yeah, yeah. Uh, because also people don't um We've learned that people don't want to be identified as having deficits, right? No one wants to be thought of as being, let's say, what they would say, hard of hearing. We might say hearing impaired, but they don't want to be known as uh, isolated. They don't want to be told I'm isolated. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Uh, I have yeah. a friend in her mid-90s, uh, long time friend and mentor and she is isolated and, and she didn't want to be told she was isolated she said I'm not isolated Paul I said you're cut off from everybody you're isolated um yeah so because it you. becomes normalized after a point right yes yes and one one guest we had on the on the podcast uh, talked about uh, it being learned right people learn they get used to being like this and and they don't think there are other ways well, so you've you've answered, partly answered this question, but is there something else you would like to say about your vision for dealing with the problem of social isolation? Yes, Paul, I think I think there are certain ways where we can address these issues because especially they, they lead to a lot of self like lack of self confidence in these people. And uh, like you said that, yes, they learn this behavior and they isolate themselves and that becomes their new comfort zone. And they think that they're happy, but they're they're actually not. So there, there are certain things that we can help them with. And so first thing is like making them aware of this thing and letting them know that it's okay. It's part of aging. And pretty much everyone goes through 
some part of it, if not all, or to some extent of it, if not all. Mm -hmm. So some of the solutions that I had in mind, and a lot of them are actually being implemented, but then it's just scaling. We just need to make sure that these things are available and more and more people are aware, especially in the remote areas. So one is hearing aids or the, or the inexpensive methods to help with that and just making it a little lighter environment that using some small things like stethoscope or, or just, just that. It can be just fun and just have a little laugh about it. And that, that's okay. Again, again, vision exam is very important. So they can have their cataracts checked, their glaucoma checked, have, have a routine exam so that it can be taken care of. And it, whatever cannot be helped, it should be like giving them an acceptance that it's okay and people around them are able to accept that. For mobility, there are a lot of things like cane, walkers, scooters, those, those are their physical therapies there to get them to um, being on their own feet as much as possible. Home health is available so that can help them uh, strengthen themselves, prevent the falls, and uh, have some transportation. Nowadays, we do have Uber and Lyft, so we just need them to be aware of uh, being able to access these um, help which is available some of them might have financial constraints to access these help and that that can be a real challenge and in that case some of the uh, non-profit organizations or maybe some government help might be leveraged another um, thing is the most biggest of all is the technological advances which like for example you and i are today today you're in canada i'm sitting here in texas and we are able to come on the same page and chat and we can do a video chatting so i think with technology there has been a lot of help a lot of advances have been done so people can connect remotely uh, on video and on audio there actually had been some research when patients or like when people are able to connect with their family members on video call maybe just for as small as 10 minutes every day they don't feel as isolated they feel like they're connected to the people they feel like they're part of the society they know what's going on uh, with their family and friends they're able to participate and help them out or ask for help if they need and just share their heart basically so nowadays, these are very, very helpful tools that we have, but you would be surprised how many people don't know how to use that. Even uh, even something as simple as giving them a link and having them to click on the link and allowing them the permission, allowing to use their camera. I can say that because I do telemedicine for a lot of my patients who have mobility issues or not able to come and they have transportation issues. So I do telehealth with them. And a lot of times I end up doing a phone call and I kind of, try to teach them how to access the video call. My staff spends a good amount of time to let, send them the link and sit with them and on phone and see if they are able to find the link. And then they guide them on step by step so they're able to come on with telehealth, which is a very simple process. So we realized that something as small as this can be challenging. I think having a little workshop or having some education session and making a lot of people aware so then a lot of people can be on that education session and then guiding them guiding them how to do that. That could be just a, a conference phone call because they might not be able to do the video, but then they guide them how to do that. And then they're able to more access um, the video calls. And again, access to internet is important for any of these things, which I think um, is available in a lot of places, but some people might still have challenges with that. So, so those are the things that uh, I was thinking that might be helpful. Uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't be surprised at all about how how many have difficulty with with uh, technological issues because we've been running into that. Uh, okay. One thing you didn't didn't mention, if I could just ask, is have you in your considerations is there a thought about social prescription for shared activities? You read my mind. I was going to tell her. That. <laughs> Ah, that's what you were going to ask. Okay, go ahead. Well, that, no, no, that's okay. Go ahead, Paul. So we are on the same no, page. That's, that's, that's really I'm good. I'm cool. wondering how you feel. You've, you've mentioned very, um, a good number of tangible measures you have. Right. And yeah. I guess I'm asking a social question. How do you feel about shared purposeful activities for people? Um, I actually feel very strongly about it and actually you read my mind too because I do have that in my next set of uh, points to talk. Okay. So before I, before I go on to that, I also do want to mention that there are some additional challenges as well because I see rheumatology patients and geriatrics. Some of them have arthritic hands so they're not able to use the phone very well. So we need to have some device to, so that they can hold the phone, they can click on the button. 
maybe they can have some stylists we can teach them how to so that those challenges are there some people are just skeptical they just don't want to allow give give a permission to use their cameras so we can guide them it's safe some of the portals are safe and we can tell them which are the things that can be safe like for example we can say like we are doing zoom zoom is fine go to meeting is fine maybe whatsapp is fine maybe whatever we've been using we can maybe viber is fine maybe we can we can help them with that so some assistance is uh, required and uh, a lot of people are not aware of the available solutions so letting them know so coming to the shared activities so this is what actually i had uh, I had compiled a list of things that shared activities, they encourage people, they make them feel very lively, they make them feel part of the community and they feel some newness and some something new that they're meeting new people, they're learning new activities. As uh, that's part of the geriatric training, we used to encourage uh, gathering of the elderly people and coming together and doing some art classes. So they're learning new skills. They are learning how to sketch. Uh, I personally sat in one of them and interacted with all my geriatric patients. So they were teaching how to draw hands, how to do things. And I saw that even if they are like very, very old, there is no age to learn anything new. And uh, every time you learn new, it brings a little bit of life in you. So I have seen that. Activities like having a musical session together or having a dance group together, whatever they can do. Some of the activities that uh, shared activities that people can really leverage is from doing uh, yoga, meditation or Tai Chi. And you would be surprised that chair Tai Chi can do so much for the patients. They can just sit on their chair. The people who are not able to stand up, they can just sit on the chair and do those movements to improve their strength in the legs and hands, improve their balances. So shared activities are really good and you can do a lot of shared activities in these days on video conference. Teaching new skills can help a lot uh, with improving the self-esteem and the, and creating the feeling of joy in them. So uh, I think that, that's what I would uh, say about that. Creating interest groups might be helpful too. So some people might, might have interest in some field and the other people might have interest in the others. Some people might have a uh, huge interest in some kind of music. And some people would like to dance a little bit. Some people would like to just do a little bit of gym, like or a little bit of uh, yoga together. Or some people would like to dance, like uh, draw, like they would like to art. Some mm. people would like to talk about the birds and do some birding and and some people enjoy photography a lot. Also, some people enjoy playing poker. Yeah. <laughs> and bingo. Well, bridge, bridge. Some people enjoy bridge. And they, they some are. Some people enjoy bridge. You know, if Paul is missing, just look for bridge clubs in look his for the area. Bridge club nearby, he will be mind. there somewhere. <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, this is great. I think I was going to come to social prescription, like you both mentioned. That's great. And I think um, uh, we just found a research yesterday which showed that in the UK, for every pound spent on social prescription, there was a return of 27 pounds for every pound spent. So that's a very good return on investment because um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, annually Medicare loses $6.7 billion due to isolation in older adults. Just, just, just that aspect because those patients have repeated illness recurring visits, longer visits, slower recovery time. Um, and that's just from a hospital perspective. We're not even touching quality of life and well-being in those measures. And um, so I'm going to cut to the chase and ask you, so given that your vision is educational and sometimes, uh, so ed educational community, and I wouldn't say prescriptive because a prescription is nothing but like a suggestion of doing something in a low dosed frequency manner. What do you think are the challenges in people accepting your solutions? Like what are the common barriers or challenges that people face given your vision? Sometimes people just don't have the drive to do that. So getting up in the morning or coming onto the video call or getting up in the morning and going out to the park where some event is going on. Some people, when they're already like depressed and they're already feeling isolated and they want to stay in their own cocoon or shell, it might be hard to break that shell and show them the real world and them ask them to like, hey, mm -hmm. come out, you'll feel good. So maybe we can just say that why don't you go for a walk for a few minutes every day just just prescribe for 10 minutes walk and they have to force themselves out there and maybe we can have the local doctors encourage these activities and tell them that hey force yourself out to do at least 10 minutes of social activities go to park and go to people or there are 
events, some of the events that I have been doing with my colleagues here is the uh, walk with a dog in the park. So we go there, we, we we talk about the health issues and we are just standing there and answering people's questions. Uh, sometimes people just come there that they, they'll be able to talk to the doctor and ask their concerns. Some some people are able to drag themselves out and bring them come bring themselves to the park. Uh, they talk there. They ask their questions to the doctors, but they also talk, start talking to the people who are around. And even if they're asking for a little bit of help, that also is a social, social interaction, like where did you park or uh, how long is this? Did you see the water boot? Something like that. But they are talking to people that uh, slowly brings um, that practice uh, uh, back in their life. So that has helped. And um, I think, uh, I think uh, local government or local um, uh, vendors might be able to help sponsor such events. And uh, the local Chamber of Commerce does quite a lot of help that we have uh, uh, leveraged. And some of the tech, like for example, Texas Medical Board has, they just give out pyrometers and things like that. So having those things, uh, when you create such events, uh, such uh, a little bit of uh, small free giveaways, that drives people out of their home as well. And when they come out, they say, oh, this, is, this could be fun. And we can do that maybe once a month, if not like uh, every day or if not every week. And then maybe when they start enjoying it, they can they can do this. Uh, local meetup groups are very helpful. Uh, seniors group, uh, I think, is very, very helpful. I think I know one or two communities which have seniors group. And they meet every week. They just go there. Sometimes somebody can go. Sometimes the other people can go. But they still have a good chunk of people, good good number of people who turn out. And uh, they do some activities together. They just sit there and chat. Uh, they celebrate each other's birthdays. I think celebrating birthdays are very important because as people age, they just feel like, okay, just another year left in my life. So no, it's just another year that you've loved and you've learned and you've uh, um, accomplished. So every year of life is an accomplishment. It's not like life is not easy. I mean, you have to do so much to sustain. You have to so much do so much to uh, make everything happen in one day. So one whole year is a reason enough to celebrate. So they celebrate each other's birthday, just a simple wish, or um, if we can have like a log of everybody's birthday and just send them a good good birthday wish with having lots of names at the bottom, they would feel loved. So those mm -hmm. things I think might help and might help bring them out of their shell. Thank you, thank you. I think, um, I think in my opinion, uh, we've interviewed so many people and there are two factors. One is enabling the environment, which are the things you've mentioned. But also at the end of the day, any behavioral intervention is a personal responsibility. And I think there's also a need uh, for the seniors to understand the, the impact that being shut off is having, right? And there is, of course, multiple ways this educational campaign will run, like at least companies like ours, we will be focusing on both sides because, you know, <laughs> we can't have one of the two <laughs> ready on board. We need like yes. the, the whole of it to work for our interventions to succeed but it's amazing it's really like i'm actually i feel like i'm reading a research paper you know so for me because this is what i by the way that's my thesis also right so for me i'm just having fun talking to you because it's uh, it shows me i have to really buck up buckle up and uh, publish more <laughs> paul thank you Nam. and i can see your passion and, and Paul's passion and this is a very very meaningful intervention that you are doing um this is a huge value to the society that you are doing and I'm, I'm really really very proud to be a part of this today thank you um and i i just wanted to pick up on something that you said quickly just because it's a a thing that i feel a little bit strongly about if mm -hmm. i understand one thing you said uh you imply that self-esteem is built by action self-esteem is not an yeah. abstract quality that we yeah. can sort of grab out of the air but self-esteem results from doing some of these things is that right right yeah okay. that's correct and the reason we talk about this because what we discovered through our series of podcasts some researchers definitely explained to us the difference between isolation and loneliness one is objective lack and one is subjective lack of quality connections but the interventions are very different so she said but with, uh, with isolation the root cause is your own behavior and at, at uh, like if you're not very agreeable with people or if you don't communicate because many people become you know because of chronic issues bitter and they're very not pleasant to talk to and then people don't connect with them that often not all of them but there's a percentage of who are like that 
That's Beethoven. Uh, that's Beethoven. That's Beethoven. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And the uh, or grumpy is that word. So they become grumpy, and then nobody wants to engage with them. And the the loneliness part she said was about uh, self esteem. If you have low self esteem, because a part of loneliness is also a connection with yourself. So it's not just connecting with others. Because if I have to connect with you, there's some experience that I am feeling, and then I'm bringing myself forward, right? So it's not just objective. Like if I put ten people in a room. Yes, they can talk, but there is something about themselves that they are going to bring to that conversations and something that they're going to take within. So as we and then we suddenly realize that activities is one medium where both in and out, both connections, and in fact you can even take it one level higher and connect with the divine or the higher power, because what we realize as we lost religion, we lost community, we lost, we lost uh, support systems, right? So I wouldn't say that you need to bring the church back, but I would say that you need to bring communities back in a way that there is a shared interest. And so for me, these three aspects, connection with self, connection with others, and connection with something outside, like a higher power. Um, well, technically, the higher power is inside, but I would just say for the, for the sake of easy thing, the higher power. Um, so we, we've noticed that because many people... Uh, like at least especially for me I see a lot of my own confidence levels improved as I dance more and it's not that I was short of confidence but there's certain aspects of your life which doesn't come out in your professional life you know and then when you do these hobbies very sincerely you start overcoming your own barriers of different kinds you know so I think what you're saying is important and it's surprising that this has to come from a doctor's office now instead of common sense community <laughs> but it has more weight coming out of a doctor's yeah office. yeah like even for children we prescribe play now 90 percent kids don't play enough now and uh, so it's the similar kind of a situation we've uh, become lonely isolated and sedentary and that's killing all of us you know Paul what advice would you have for our company I think you are doing really good, uh, good work in this area. I think um, uh, if you're not already doing it, maybe creating a lot of interest groups where some people can sign up for some activities and um, have them set up a time like every once a month at least, like maybe like less frequency and then it can increase as the people show interest and they want to do more and more and keeping it open to more people. I think I think you're already doing a lot of things. So I don't know what else I can add, but maybe maybe uh, having some activities together, like having some uh, local um, trainers or people finding the experts in some areas. So for example, maybe an artist, like a special artist session. If anybody wants to learn how to how to draw a tree or how to draw a yeah. hand, how something like that. Maybe a, an expert photographer, a, a guest visitor, and then. A lot of people might join in just to see how that works. Maybe, maybe an expert um, in uh, in ballet or something, or maybe in Tai Chi. Yeah. Or a lot of people do find interest in Tai Chi and yoga these days and meditation. So those things, group group medica- meditation can also work. I particularly enjoy being a part of one of my um, medical college community. Community they have like a lot of retired and elderly doctors, but I I, I enjoy joining that. They do a lot of uh, periodic singing sessions and dancing sessions and cooking sessions and uh, to that matter, like baking. A lot of people love baking. So they do those activities and they enjoy it a lot. I think maybe including those kind of activities and having like once a month special yeah. may help if, if you're not already doing that. But I see that you're already doing a lot of them. Which is, like... <laughs> <laughs> well, our plans are subject to a lot of uh, Omicron and Delta and Alpha, Beta, like, you know. So, of course, COVID has, of course, this came out of a solution for post-COVID rehab. But uh, I think a baking, Paul would give that example. Paul, I'll let you tell. I'll not steal your thunder, you know. <laughs> the it's research. a very good idea. It's a very yeah. good idea. Yeah, he found a research that many people, one of his uh, uh, psychiatrist researchers, friends, I think, talked about mm-hmm. that baking helps reduce depression in many people. And in, uh, so it's like, but in my opinion, I think what we are not doing and maybe what you and I can do together is uh, we wanted to work closely with um, 
at least one doctor's office so that uh, so what we're doing is we've made a content hybrid so basically but the, the hybrid part is in canada it's not yet in like texas and all because it's a little hard to do it remotely right now but we do so we have what we've decided is let's say we have 20 25 instructors and we're giving trial classes for everything okay so uh, we can if you have your patient base we can do that and then if anybody likes anything of course they can join seniors junction so we'll be of course we'll talk about it offline but we want and from my thesis i'm doing uh, how do you build a social prescription decision uh, method so because you have so many things you mentioned right right now what where social prescription is it's at a list level and i'm trying to make a decision methodology for it like how do you know what to tell whom to tell what are the parameters how do you connect it so I think uh, you and I now, and Paul, this is the first time we actually spoke, though we know each other for like, I don't know, 15 years now. Uh, we didn't speak a lot in details on this topic at all. So it's very interesting now that to know that I may be able to finally collaborate with her. <laughs> yeah. Likewise, Namrata, it's a, it's a really uh, passionate uh, topic and I'm so glad that one of my best friends is <laughs> so much interested. Yeah. Right. Paul, you were saying something? No, no, I think it's great. Yeah, I, I think it's great. Yes, that you've um, correctly understood what we want to do. Yeah, that, that I... is our idea. And our, our model too, uh, um, our model kind of has a baseline below which you would need a medical intervention. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then, but then if you're above that baseline, you could start an activity and you could Get yeah. some interest we, and connectedness from it and continue and could give you purpose could give you more connectedness purpose connectedness purpose connectedness and and you could thrive in these in these years uh, i take the thriving part personally because yeah. i'm 66 years old i want to not just survive but i want to thrive yeah i think i'm going to send you uh the model if you've not seen it but i'll send it to you now after this uh, recording i would be interested to hear what you think of the model yeah yeah sure. yeah so jaya if people want to find out about you how can they find you so i do have a website which lists all the information it is www.jsrhealth.com and i can actually share a slide with uh, my contact information i do have an email and a phone number uh, let me just see if I can share that. I will put it on the chat uh, in the, the, in the chat. sorry in the release. Uh, when we release, you can give it to me. Okay. So I can send you that slide and just include that, so they will have access. Yeah, mostly all the information is available on my website, including the email address and the phone mm -hmm. number. And I will be happy to answer any questions. They can also put in their questions in the web portal itself, and I'll be happy to address. And I would be happy to. Um, make my patients aware of uh, senior junction so they can leverage your uh, intervention and they can become a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think it's important because today, uh, last uh, but not least, the statement I would like to make, I think social connections are not just offline, it's virtual too. And digital yeah. inclusion is today a part of social determinant of health. Like it's, it's, it's become a part of it. So because we've seen that the world is hybrid. So you have to enhance your capacity, right? So thank you, thank you so much, Jaya. I am so, thank so happy to much. record this. Thank well, you thank you for inv inviting me to this uh, show and I am really proud to be a part of Senior Junction and uh, being able to contribute something to this hugely meaningful of course. Of course. Thank you, thank you.